The Grant Museum of Zoology in London has one of the world's most impressive collections of ancient animals. One of them is this, a quagga. Now, quagga went to extinction in the 19th century, but was essentially a half-striped zebra. And for many years, researchers here thought this was the skeleton of a zebra. It was only in the 1970s that they finally realized, in fact, it was this different animal. But by that point, they realized they had lent the leg out to various researchers, and that leg hadn't come back. Fast forward 40 years, and it's only now that they've been able to use modern technology, namely 3D printing, to reproduce an exact replica of the leg. 3D printing was certainly the, the best and the easiest way to, to restore the missing leg of the quagga. The, the other alternatives would have been to, to cast it in a mold, which could have potentially damaged the, the thin and fragile bones, uh, bone elements of the leg. So being able to scan it and then printing it is a completely non-invasive, safe and pretty cheap way of us being able to, to complete the skeleton. 3D printing in museums is definitely going to be a big part of the, of the future, I think. There's plenty of objects that are incomplete, that are missing bits, that are certainly big fossil skeletons that you find. You very rarely find uh, complete skeletons, and, and the bits have always needed to be, to be uh, added in. And 3D printing is going to be a really simple and cheap and a much more popular way of doing that in the future. Down the road, another museum famed for its ancient objects is using digital devices to change how it interacts with visitors. The British Museum opened in 1753 and was the world's first national public museum. To have survived for 250 years, it's had to be constantly innovative in its approach. And in the 21st century, that means using cutting edge technology to amplify what it does and engage users. So what I'm looking at right now is a Bronze Age roundhouse, which is about what would have existed about three and a half thousand years ago. There's a fire in the hut, which is very inviting. I'm gonna take a look, duck my head. And over there, there's an interesting object, which is flashing blue. The museum has unveiled a virtual reality experience where visitors can explore some of its Bronze Age collection in its natural context. I think virtuality has a specific role to help people understand objects in their original context. It's very hard in a museum when you abstract an object from where it came from, so I help people understand kind of how it was used. Uh, and so that's a great opportunity for us, is to put through virtual reality the objects back to where they came from so people understand the lives that were led using the objects that we have in the collection. The VR technology is also being used at the Natural History Museum to bring sea creatures to life from 500 million years ago, with Sir David Attenborough as a guide for the journey. The nice thing about first life is that you can see the fossils upon which the virtual reality experience is based, but still get through virtual reality a wonderful evocation of what these animals look like in life. We want to reduce the cost of delivering this technology so that more and more people can enjoy it. At the moment, of course, we're using, we're using headsets and uh, uh, proprietary smartphones supplied uh, to our visitors. Ultimately, the, the best experience will be having something that will work across a, a multitude of platforms delivered to people's own devices. So that is our ultimate goal. The key thing is, I think, where does technology add value to the real experience of visiting a museum and seeing real objects? At the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, change began in 2011, when the institution stopped telling visitors to put down their smartphones and started encouraging them to use them instead. The Met saw an opportunity. There was a worry across all cultural institutions that if you put too many photographs out in the world, then people won't want to come to see the real thing. The virtual would trump the physical. And I don't think that's the case. I think it's the exact opposite. The more people see something, the more they want to go see it in person. People are in a digital world, but they really love physical experiences. We're trying to make a virtuous circle. We want the digital experience so, to be so fantastic that people want to come in person. And then once people come in person, we want them to love everything they see so that then they want to share it with their friends uh, around the world and uh, stay connected to us through mobile, social, digital, email, etc. We have uh, launched uh, an app for uh, folks who are interested in the museum. We still have the regular audio guide, but we've put the contents of the audio guide on the internet, on your smartphone. You can just go via any browser to metmuseum.org and you can actually see 
and listen to the contents of the museum in this new way. Successful companies have to change how they operate when consumers demand it. If they don't, those customers will go somewhere else. But for museums that have little trouble pulling in the crowds, changes come because technologies such as 3D printing have come down in cost and curators see new ways to engage visitors. And if that makes more people able to experience the extraordinary treasures in these extraordinary institutions, that can only be for the good. Ravi Matu, Financial Times, London.